Survivor's ready. Go! Job is spoken. This island is pretty much full of only two things. Snakes and rats. The fake dead grandmother could easily go down as the dirtiest thing ever to be done in this game. I am the king, and I am back. But I've got the million dollar check written already. I mean, I'm, I'm the winner. The winner of the first Survivor competition is... Rich. Direct from Hobart, it's now time for the only dedicated radio show in Australia devoted to the hit TV show Survivor, bringing you the latest news and the biggest interviews from the king of reality television. It's Survivor Oz, and here's your host, Ben Waterworth. Hello everybody and welcome once again to Survivor Oz, Australia's number one TV and film podcast as we continue our coverage of the 29th season of Survivor San Juan del Sur. Episode 13 is done. We're here for our penultimate episode recap. And as we have been doing all season, we get two former players on the show, one of whom was the 300th person ever voted out of Survivor, the other who only competed last season, and it's taken us 13 episodes to get somebody from the previous season to chat about this season. I'm going to introduce him first. He finished fourth on Survivor, Kagayan. His name is Spencer Bledsoe, and he's with us now. Spencer, welcome back to Survivor Oz. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. My my debut since I got those awards. Yes. Yes, exactly. I, I didn't mention the um, the Oscar awards. How rude of me, Spencer! Come on, now that's all you're known for, isn't it? I know. I was I was pretty offended. You really really bruised my ego there by not bringing Sorry. up my biggest accomplishment that is Survivor related. <laughs> yes. Um. So <laughs> I'll make sure I reference it at least another thirty times throughout this recap, just to uh, just make <laughs> up for it. No. 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 Happy. Really. Really happy to be here. Love talking Survivor. I'm on like the podcast circuit. You I are. did R H A P. Um. So. So I'm really happy to be here and have an international podcast with you. Well, uh, it's going to definitely be a big week for Spencer fans on podcasts, let's put it that way. But uh, also joining us on the line. Now, we're very um, we're very happy to have uh, our next guest with us to be with Spencer because these two, well, we're going to get to this in a second. Uh, he, of course, as I said, the 300th person ever voted out from Survivor. I don't think he's ever been introduced that way before. Uh, from Survivor Nicaragua, Mr. Marty Piombo. Marty, welcome back to Survivor Oz. Thank you very much, Ben. Thanks for having me on, and uh, very humbled and uh, happy to be on with Spencer. Finally, having an opportunity to chat with him. This is uh, this is great fun. And the the interesting thing for people listening at home is that not only do I have two people on from two different seasons, we are literally doing this from three different countries and three different continents. Uh, obviously, I'm in Australia. Spencer's joining us from Chicago, and Marty's joining us from London. This is like <laughs> this is the continental podcast. So, Marty, what are you doing in London now? Listeners are going, why are you over in the UK right now? <laughs> Well, we were we were organized to do this uh, podcast, and I was in the United States. But late last week, I was asked. Uh, my company asked me to make a trip out to uh, the UK. So I've been in uh, in beautiful Belfast, which I can't recommend uh, more highly. In the middle of December, uh, to go to Belfast, beautiful beautiful time of year to be there. Um, and I'm being highly sarcastic. It was probably <laughs> the most cold, bleak, rainy, damp, and awful. Uh, <laughs> and now I'm back in London uh, and and finally getting ready to uh, go home after being on the road for about a week if, or so. If Nayanka and Purple Kelly were on your business trip, would they quit? <laughs> <laughs> they, they would have quit after touching down in Belfast, I think, like 30 minutes into it. Oh, oh wow. Hello, Purple Kelly um, and Nayanka. Um, Sorry, no no offense to friends of the podcast. So. No, 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 we just will ignore Purple Kelly and her relationship with this show. We can, we'll can let her open slather to joke she'll take it as one spencer how chicago has is the weather that marty just described i mean that kind of sounds like chicago at this time of year too surely yeah yeah i would i would launch into a sarcastic uh monologue but i would it would pale in comparison to marty's <laughs> um but yeah it's it's pretty brutal it's maybe in the teens degrees right now so good and cold as we know and love in chicago um i'm actually graduating soon so thankfully i will avoid a lot of the winter here is that tomorrow so. i believe as well can i just congratulate you yeah well I, done. how yes. did you know well I, I it's only like you told to... me <laughs> oh right right forgot <laughs> <laughs> I'm a stalker, Spencer. Sorry, I just um, I'm outside your house right now. I'm not really in Hobart, so 
All right, cool. Yep. I guess it's not as international a podcast as we thought then, no. but I'll take it. Ruined it, ruined it. But, I mean, before we talk about this episode and this season, uh, I've got to touch on this, um, well, I was going to say bromance, but I think, Marty, you kind of just shut that down. Uh, <laughs> this, <laughs> this admiration, is that the correct word? Because, of course, Spencer, you talked in your pregame about your admiration for Marty. Marty, when we, yeah. you had you on last season to talk about Kagayan, we discussed this. Um, and this is the first time, I believe, that you two have kind of really had an opportunity to to meet and talk to each other isn't it so spencer he's marty he's the man that you talked about in your pre-game yes <laughs> it's a dream come true it's uh this is a guy that i've wanted to grab a beer with forever and i marty was talking about it um before the show but basically i think it's just a, a respect thing that i think i i thought about the game the way he did and the way he approached it was sort of you know chess-like and strategic and, and very smart and and uh, I, I just related to him both on a personality level and bo- and on a game level and thought he was an awesome character and uh, from the moment that Alina called him a, a jackass basically I thought he was going to be great um, <laughs> and he didn't disappoint I that my biggest disappointment with Nicaragua and this isn't just blowing smoke was that he didn't make it further than he did aww Marty, look, wow. look at that. Oh. Wow. <laughs> it's true. I tell that to my friends. I told that to my friends before I went on the show and, and knew you. It's true. How's that, Marty? How's it hearing all that? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, this is going to be a mutual admiration society here, definitely for a bit. No, uh, I think I think we did think about the game similarly, and I think, um, you know, we shared, and, and we're just huge fans, right? I mean, you guys know that watching some of these seasons where, you know, half the people that are on it are not necessarily... Uh, followers of the game, they're not into the game, they're there for so many other reasons, is hugely, massively disappointing to those of us that uh, think about the game that we do. And so, uh, in that regard, as I watch Spencer, and also, um, although I, I would clearly say that Spencer outperformed the way that I played in my game, not only by making it as far as he did, but also, you know, there were some other similarities in terms of, you know, tribal switches and whatnot that we both faced adversity that were very similar so you know but he uh like i was saying earlier you know spencer won three immunity challenges found an idol and managed to uh you know wheedle and cajole his way through the game as i would have uh <laughs> loved to have done, uh, myself and and made it as far as he did so and like i said before let's be honest you know spencer's actually a nice guy and uh you know uh following my season preseason, or like lena's comments uh I was not always perceived as a nice guy. You know, I was definitely a, a yeah. villain. And, uh, you know, so I've got that. I mean, I think I was just nice compared to the expectation, which was pretty low. <laughs> um, set, set a low bar so that you can pass it. But I think I'm excited for this. I think this is the vernacular of this podcast <laughs> with Weedle and Cajole already on the board <laughs> is going to be good. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and, what I, you know, with, with what you said with uh, my game, you know, making it further i think it's interesting with something like a tribe swap that i could have gone out when jatia went out in my season easily and i had a lot go my way and i had a lot not go my way and one of the things that went my way which didn't go yours uh was the tribe swap and one that really saved me and for you the tribe swap was your demise yeah, and I think, you know, and I know this podcast is about a, a lot more than Spencer and I going on about our seasons, but the other thing that's really hard, um, and as much as, you know, Spencer and I may have played the game or approached the game very similarly, at the end of the day, uh, my personality was probably, is is very polarizing and at times controversial, or at least it was on my season, and it's pretty hard to see somebody like Tony who's also a very polarizing and controversial person, make it as far as he did. You just don't get to see that very often, and it's awesome when it does happen. But the fact that Spencer was able to get up at that final tribal and and talk to people and get them to vote in a way that's really representative of the game, and you got to take everything off, off the table and vote unemotionally on who actually made the right moves to get them to where they are to win. I think that was that was an awesome move and a, and and hats off to Spencer for that piece too. So so good good stuff. Yeah, I'm super super psyched to be on with Spencer. This is so Survivor Oz, isn't it? We're all sucking up to each other. It's beautiful. Yeah. We're so Survivor Ozing right now. 
<laughs> it's an adjective, pretty much. With it, I mean, I'm, I'm looking here at, um, I mean, Spencer's pre-game interview where, and I know we talked to you about this, Marty, um, when we had you on for the recap last year, but um, where Spencer says, like Marty, I'm a natural leader and can come off come off as pompous or bombastic. <laughs> also, I share Marty's disdain <laughs> for Jane on season 21. So look, we can sit here for you know an hour or so and just bag out Jane if you really want to. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right, can I get my Jane dance down? How do you do it? Is it like? Please, please. <laughs> oh, God. Can you imagine? Oh, if you could only imagine when she would come back and do that. It was it was so god-awful painful. Well, I have a surprise for you guys. Joining us on the line from Season 21, Nicaragua, <laughs> yes! Jane Bright. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, you can download that interview via SurvivorOz.com. I'll get a segue in there at least. Um, but uh, Survivor, San Juan del Sur, Season it's 29. It's a long road on the path to 400 and whatever, every Survivor. Yeah, well, we're at, what are we, 267 right now. So, um, yeah, we're a bit slow recently. But we've been concentrating on other things. Um, we've had exit interviews to do this year. It's a first. So we've been having Very good. fun with those. Uh, Survivor Sam Wondell, sir. Uh, I always like to start off the recaps and kind of get just an initial thoughts on, you know, how you've been enjoying the season. I'll start with you, Marty. Have you been enjoying this season? What's kind of been your general vibe on season 29 of Survivor? Well, I think like we talked about earlier, I, I was, until this last episode, getting very, very psyched because I thought it would be you know, the first season that would surpass my season as being the worst season of Survivor ever. So um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed in that this last episode actually really uh, brought some entertainment value finally um, to this season. So we can get into that. But, uh, yeah, frankly, I just haven't been... And I know that's so hard to say that because it's so mean, especially uh, for people that are on a season. But you know what? I lived it on my season and I wasn't crazy about my own season so i'm just going to throw it out there it just hasn't had uh enough of what you would consider to be exciting in a season you know and and there's no. some good people on there's some interesting personalities but uh but that's sort of where i'm i'm coming from and we can you know maybe talk about uh as i'm sure i think i run out of you know, dumber than a bag of hammer awards to give out for this season. I'm sure we'll get to that. Again. Oh, I have a list of question about that. Trust me, we got one of those. Any, um, before before Spencer, get your thoughts. I mean, I think Spencer and I share a similar viewpoint in your season that Nicaragua really isn't as bad. I don't think as people like Nicaragua actually yes, yes. is a pretty good season. I think it's underrated. I, I use that word a lot, but I mean, your season, Marty, was followed by Redemption Island. Can we not forget that? Well, I mean, we want to forget Redemption Island, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, at the same time, it was preceded by. By heroes versus villains. Um, so just like total, this season total, is preceded total. by Kagayan, so... Yeah, I mean, yeah. it goes both ways. I I think that, actually, I have a higher view of Redemption Island than, than a lot of people, in that I don't think it's complete garbage, just kind of garbage. <laughs> and, um, and you're right, that I think Nicaragua is really underrated. It had characters, if not players, and... Um, and this season's the same way. It has it has some people to at least laugh at, maybe not laugh with all the time, or or identify with, or root for, but definitely people that make it interesting. Well, I, I generally always because um, we kind of have a tradition that every season we do recaps, we get at least one person from the previous season on. So obviously, it's, we've got new Spencer. What was it like, kind of starting to watch this season after all the hype? surrounding you kind of the last season not just because of how you played but because you're on the season you had to kind of get used to people recognizing you and all that stuff that was happening to now kind of it being a little bit of a lull like we're into new people now so you slightly get shoved aside is it a weird feeling going back to just being a fan now it is weird um overall it's really good i'm glad to be out of the uh i don't even know if i would call it a spotlight but i'm glad to no longer have attention on me and just enjoy the show because i i I liked doing survivor mainly for doing survivor more than i liked it for being on tv um getting to meet people i've watched on survivor is a huge huge plus um, but it wasn't, uh, the TV aspect of it wasn't my favorite. Um, and so I think, uh, just sort of easing out of that and going from being recognized rarely to being recognized never, um, <laughs> has been pleasant. Um, let's, and, let's you know, here. let's be clear here for a moment. And I'm going to quote after Ben's, uh, announcement, uh, about the upcoming interview tonight to quote Mr. Greg Nance, 
Spencer Bledsoe is so hot right now. Okay, his star is not waning. It's not waning. That's it, hilarious. You know, that <laughs> That's one of my former fraternity brothers just messing with me. That's the one guy uh, who commented who I actually know. It's hilarious you mentioned Greg Nance. <laughs> well, I was, I was intrigued by all the comments, of course, tagging you both in that photo. I'm like, I'm looking at it like waking up this morning. Oh, lots of questions. And it's like, oh, okay. Spencer's hot. Marty, how's your mom? Uh, my favorite comment was, that Marty guy is pretty good looking. Or that Marty guy. <laughs> was, that, was that a family member, Marty? Uh <laughs> The silver fox. The silver fox. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, one of the um, the the quick... hair is. Well, where's the hair at? You got to have the survivor style. No, it was here. It was here, dude. It's like four thirty in the morning. I was trying to work on it. You know, there's less of it to, to go around now. But yeah, I was working on it. Well, one of the comments I got was uh, Morgan Staub said, um, looking at the photo I put up, I just realized that this looks like a past slash present photo of Marty, and I've got you both on cam in front of me here, and it's kind of like, oh, this is sort of like a time lapse going on here <laughs> wow flattering. Uh, is, is that an insult or a compliment uh, <laughs> i don't know it's, it's an insult to one of us and compliment to the other but i yes. don't know who yes well it's um no, there was even some similarities with the hairdo i mean spencer has straight hair like straw like mine he definitely had yeah. some of that you know uh My hair was you know sir. yeah <laughs> yeah Oh, uh, we can it was. I mean, style. you know, Drew Christie's got some hair going on too, though. He's, uh, true, you know, he, he, I don't know if you know, but he's a model. You've probably seen him somewhere. Um, yeah. So he's, uh, he's basically a badass. Mm. And it's. <laughs> Drew Lander. He's ridiculously oh, good looking. Yep. If only. If, see, the problem, I think, with this season is, is there's been people who are really compelling like that, but they went out so early. And we're left. It's. It's. I think I underestimated going into this how important it was to me to root for someone. Um, right now, I'm. I'm kind of rooting for Natalie, but it's. It's tough to choose. I mean, there aren't that many people that I can really get behind and say, okay, you're a strategic player, and you have a good story. It's just that kind of season. Well, this is the thing I think with this season. Um, really, kind of, have had it for the last few weeks as well. That everybody out there, there's no brilliant players. They're not stupid players they're just kind of average and i mean and even i think jeff Probst kind of said like do you consider them players and i mean this is i think what makes this unique this season is that <coughs> we've kind of i feel gotten a lot of this season character moments which we haven't had i feel in survivor for some time because modern survivor is so strategically focused now that we forget what it was like in the early days to hey let's you know yeah. hear about john's family back home and you know natalie missing a sister and i mean i don't know spencer if that's something that is it's kind of is that modern Modern Survivor showing what we used to see, but because we're used to it now, it's weird. <laughs> I think it it is, but it's different. It's not really. I don't think it's being done in the same way because right now they're not showing the personal character development insights because you know those insights and that story to tell is just so compelling. I think it's more because there's not as much of the strategy and the things Modern Survivor normally focuses on to show. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw this past episode that. You know, Natalie, um, she votes the wrong way or the way she said she she wouldn't, and she acts like, oh, I, I just messed up, um, and no one batted an eyelash. Oh, right. yep. The fact that no one batted an eyelash and just accepted that suggests to me that the strategy is not as multifaceted and focused as as normal. Well, Marty, you pointed out before, and this is kind of something that we've been talking a lot about on our episodes um, earlier this year as well, it's like... Most of the people in this season don't seem to be fans, whereas, like, your season, Spencer, for the most part, it seemed like everybody was a fan. This season, yeah, there's only yeah. a handful who know the game and sort of, and they're all gone. So, I mean, on saying that, is that, Marty, do you feel going to affect a season when, say, you've only got four or five people who have watched this game for a while and know what to do? And, you know, you've got a bunch of people, and probably the final five, really, are people who don't really know too much about the strategic side and are playing it their way. Yeah, I think, and listen, every fan that watches the show watches it for different reasons, and everyone relates to uh, to the cast in different ways, obviously. I mean, if you look at, you know, my season, and you try to scratch your head and think, how did Jane win the fan favorite? Not not that I think I was anywhere near, you know, you know anywhere near get winning that, but if you think about that, you go, holy cow, who... 
who who is going to win the fan favorite, you know, and it ends up being Jane, then it tells you something pretty serious about who's watching the game. So, but for those of us like myself and like Spencer, I think a lot of people that do watch, you know, you're looking for strategy. You're looking for people that are not going to walk in and say the stupid ass things that like Keith said, for example, and completely rock the game because they're just, oh, God, you just like, I, I mean, I saw that coming so far in advance on that episode, as soon as they were planning it, I turned to my wife and I was like, dear God, unless unless they tell him to absolutely shut his <laughs> mouth and not say one thing, that plan's going to go sideways immediately, <laughs> which, boom, you know, so, yep. um, so I'd like to watch it for the strategic people, and when you see them go, when I saw Josh go, when I saw Jeremy go, it was like, oh man, and I didn't really see it in Natalie, um, I do now, but yeah, I mean, when you think about what you just said, for example, like, in my season or with other players, like if Natalie had said, oh, whoops, I voted for the... I mean, like, there's no way, man. Like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> well, I mean, you know? John, John and Jacqueline believing that was amazing. But one thing I'd like to get your opinion, both of your opinions on this, the editing. I think the editors this season have done a fantastic job because we sort of got midway through there where it was like Josh and Jeremy were all like, okay, one of them's going to win. Josh goes like, okay, Jeremy's won this, hands down. Then his blind side was such a viewer blind side like it just you did not see that coming and you're like what the fuck what's going on now and then you're kind of looking at someone like a John who he's just gone and everybody who's left has had a donut of confessionals episodes so they've had a zero confessional episode Natalie was and Jacqueline are two people who were very invisible from the start they've only started coming through now Missy's had her ups and downs um, Baylor and Keith are really the only two consistent edits but I mean again their edits maybe haven't been gameish they've sort of been entertaining I suppose you could say so, so I mean Marty, on that, the editing this season, do you, can you give any props to them for kind of trying to make us, the audience, a little bit sort of shocked? They're giving us a lot of red herrings here to think, well, this is going to happen when that doesn't happen. Yeah, I think, you know, they've been dealt a really tough hand. And I think when you watch, I don't know if you guys notice, and maybe it's just me and maybe I'm just totally wrong here, but especially in the beginning of this season, it was like there was almost no confessionals. Like, I felt like there was... Yeah. Almost no, conf- and, and to me, I was scratching my head and saying, well, you know, I think every cast has people that are good at confessionals and people that are not good at confessionals, and I know that in my season, you know, p- people had, I think, struggled a lot with how to how to talk to the producers and how to give a good confessional, and in the beginning of the season, it was like, holy cow, there's like no confessionals here, so I think they did a pretty good job, and back to your earlier point, I'm not crazy about when people when they drag in too much of the personal stuff into the game, because it's really the game. And I, I don't, I, you know, I don't mean to sound like a harsh asshole, but I don't, and I've, I've gone through probably more personal tragedy than anybody else, but it has nothing to do with the game. You know, you're there to play a game. So, you know, involving things that are completely outside of the game, you know, is, is a little bit interesting, but you really want to focus on what's, uh, you know, what's happening and who's playing the game. And, and frankly, for me, and, and Spencer hopefully is on board with me here because I'm going to sound like a complete lame lunatic, but when I watch every season of Survivor, I get like butterflies in my stomach because I'm literally thinking about what would I do, how would I do it, how would I approach it, what would I do next, you know, and, and trying to, you know, decipher all this stuff. And in this season, there's none of that. I'm like, you know, it's sort of like whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I feel the same way that especially when the season started and I had high hopes, I you know, you're so in your survivors so ingrained in you. It was such a big experience that it's hard not to get those butterflies. And then as it's gone on, I don't know if it's just being burnt out or if it's the season, but it that did fade. Um, and I think it definitely was a result in what you talked about, you know, people playing the game strategically in a rootable way. Um, but, you know, to Ben's point about editing, I think they've made the most of it. I think they've made the most of a tough uh, a tough job in that they've kept us guessing. They haven't left us in, like, a, a fans versus favorites Caramoan situation where everyone and their mother knows that Cochran's going to win way before it happens. Yeah. Um, right now, I, I don't even – I can't even see any of these people winning. Um, I mean, Natalie makes sense, but like you said, Marty, you've only really seen it more recently, her strategic side, and I think that's because they really downplayed her. They didn't focus on her that much in the edit. Um, Definitely a good question in terms of that, but I mean, one 
thing that we like to do, and again, we I know we read a lot too much into this sometimes because confessional counts mean nothing in the grand scheme of things, really. But um, in terms of a confessional count comparison, we haven't really gone into a finale where everybody who's left has had so little confessionals since actually your season, Marty. I mean, going into the finale of Nicaragua, you know, Fabio had only had 25 confessionals. Um, Chase had had 29 looking here. Sash, 22. I mean, look at your season last year, Spencer. Tony had 90 confessionals. Um, yes. You, you had 63. Um, you know, I mean, yeah. that's just a kind of a comparison there. Uh, just for the record, uh, Marty, you had a grand total of 42. Just want to point that out. But uh, going into this season, like, I mean, Keith had 39, Natalie's 35, Baylor's 34, Jacqueline and Missy on 25 each. Jeremy had the most confessionals for this entire season until John overtook him only about a week or so ago. So it's, it's kind of just fascinating all this airtime from these people that we're not getting, which leads me then to the point, Spencer, which you kind of just brought up there saying you can't see anybody winning. Do you feel, Spencer, this is the most open finale ever in terms of everybody could technically win and everybody could technically lose? Well, okay, two things. First, with the number of confessionals, it's that is indicative of you know who is seen as a big character, and I think the big factor with this season is they don't say, okay, you know, who went far, let's make them big characters. They say, who would be a good big character, and then make them a big character. Mm. And in Nicaragua, that was Marty and, you know, for better or worse, Jane, somewhat. Um, I'll have a, I'll have a and, trivia uh, question about Nicaragua in a second and, for you both. <laughs> sure. And Nayanka, um, you know, and so they, they, they create the big characters, but if the big characters go out, around when Jeremy and Josh did, then you're not going to have a lot of confessionals from anyone, really. When the big characters just happen to be Tony and Cass, who won't go really far, then all of a sudden you're looking at big characters who are going to be a focal point of the show, and it helps them build a story. Um, So speaking to the latter part of what you said with this being an open Final Five, I think it's super open. I think that you know it's it's people that really no one has the stereotypical winners at it if that exists mm-hmm. and i could see any of three people with a real shot of winning which is more than you can say in most final fives and i am going to be very intrigued to hear who you say there cuz I am kind of on a bit of that page as well marty um open final five open finale what's your thoughts on it um, I mean, for me, given who's left in the game right now, it's really it's a no brainer for me. I, I don't see anybody else that that I could sit here and say deserves to be, you know, sitting at the final three, sitting at the final two, or even winning it. For me, it's 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 Natalie and it's Natalie and it's Natalie. I mean, I can't, I just can't fathom anyone else being anywhere near that. I don't know, Spencer. I mean, do you? What are, what are, what are your thoughts as you look at the final? That- I mean, that's what I want. I want Natalie to win, and I feel the same way that if I were playing, I would say, please, Natalie, make the frickin' end so that I don't have to write the name down of anyone else. Um, but with the seasons, with how the season's been going, with the fact that Natalie had a very minimal edit for a long time, and with the fact that if the people who are left are thinking straight, they should be targeting Natalie at Final Four and looking to cut her right before the end, I have a sinking feeling that there are a few people who could win and i think it could be a situation where we look back on the season and say yeah that wasn't a very satisfying ending the trivia question i just want to quickly hear quickly raise just before i forget to do it who got the most confessionals on your season marty and both of you chime in who you think got the most on marty on nicaragua Uh, Nicaragua, yeah um (laughs) i'm gonna say probably maybe even Jane, God, I hate to say, but you got to think about how far they made it, right? I mean, I didn't make it as far as I could have, so f- I would I would think that if you counted sort of confessionals, I'd have to be up there, but um, but I was, you know, the second person on the jury, so you get a limited opportunity that way. So probably I'm going to guess Jane, but Jane and and Nayanka, you know, Jane. Yeah, Jane is I was not thinking, correct, but um, sorry. <laughs> I was thinking Nayanka was possible. Um, I did definitely not Fabio. Uh, I mean, Sash was. I, I remember Sash was 
viewed as or presented depicted whatever as one of the more strategic players but i don't remember if he really got that much air time um right, if, not, if not if not jane if not Na- if not nayanka I, I wouldn't have to think you would be next well purple uh, kelly I, definitely didn't um <laughs> <laughs> she only got she five like, for the entire season the amazing thing about purple kelly is she had like 10 straight episodes of zero confessionals and then they finally decide to use her it's like this big moment we're f- hearing from purple kelly and her confessional is like well, reward today was you get to go to a farm and see cows and milk your own milk. And uh, we should have gone because that's amazing. And yeah, we should have gone because that's amazing. Yep. And that was her confessional. <laughs> she went the first six without a confession. I think Brenda broke that for most in a row on Caramoan. But um, from the opening episode, Purple Kelly holds the record. She only got five. Uh, Marty, you got the second most, believe it or not. You got 42 confessionals, which was second behind Nayonka. She got 50 confessionals. So she got the most. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Fabio wow, next. a good company, man. Yeah, Fabio. Yes, that's sir. a that's a faster pace than that's one of the fastest paces ever. Yep. I mean, I I got what sixty three and I lasted a lot longer. Sixty three um, and, you got and Cass most. as well. That's yeah, that's crazy. That's fascinating. Both of you got yeah. second most in your season. You beat Cass by two confessionals, Spencer. Tony ninety. Yeah. But I mean, that was the <laughs> most confessionals from a winner. I think uh, we. I'm not going to go over this all over again, but I think in the history of Survivor, only three from memory winners have gotten ninety or more. Um, actually, it might even be three players in general. How many How many people have? I mean, Russell and Samoa, other than that, how many um, people have? Cole... Boston Rob and Redemption Island. No, Boston Rob only got 89. Um, Richard got 91 oh. on Borneo. Colby got 96 in Australia. Mm. And I think I think there's only three. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Rob Sestanino got 94 on Amazon. So it might be only four. And, that, and those are all just super early seasons. That's a different yeah. era. Exactly. I mean, that, that's when they... Sharing. It was pretty normal back then to get just a huge amount of confessionals um yeah. and not to just like go on a get on the soapbox but that i think like the fact that tony had that many confessionals speaks to how good the editing has been yeah. that and tony allowed them to be good because tony was this guy who was just an absurd character mm. an absurd polarizing character just really an absurd human being <laughs> and it, you don't normally that person doesn't normally win yeah. and the fact that he oh. did win meant that editing could afford to just hit you over the face with it and you still wouldn't see it coming. There's, there's an analysis in yep. there somewhere because, I mean, your season, Spencer, I mean, Tony gets 90, you get 63, Cass gets 61, even Wu got 34. So, I mean, we haven't had that sort of higher average out of the final 4-5 in a very long time. I mean, you go back to Borneo... Uh, Richard gets 91, Kelly gets 81, Rudy gets 52, and Sue's, Sue gets 63. Fast forward to um, Samoa, Russell Hans 108, that's a record. Uh, Natalie White, 15. So, <laughs> which is embarrassing that the winner only yeah. gets 15 confessionals. <laughs> uh, okay, you've got Russell Hance on a season, but seriously, come on. Let, let, yeah. let me ask you about one. What about what about Sophie Clark? I'd be interested in seeing how many she got, for she, example, and she won. 26. Um, she got there 26, go. Albert there 26, go. Coach got 74. So, wow. yeah. yeah, it's... It's fascinating kind of, um, you know, looking at these newer seasons because, you know, you mentioned Boston Rob. I mean, he got 89 on Redemption Island, but, I mean, of course, you got Philip. He's still got 41. Um, Natalie Tenerelli only got 14. But, um, you know, I mean, a, a one world, Kim Spradlin, 54. Sabrina got 42 somehow that season. Um, and Alicia's got 41. And so it, it's, it's fascinating just looking at confessionals and again sort of you know that's not the be all end all of who wins the game and everything but as you were saying Spencer it's more about the entertainment factor and who's a character so to speak right but it's correlated I mean at the same time you you absolutely have to you know you don't the show isn't going to build someone up just because they go far but going far might make it a little more likely that they build you up Um, I think that was the case with me I think that if I had gone less far, okay, maybe now we focus a little less on making Spencer this underdog figure and a little more on other storylines. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, that that phenomenon is the truest with the winner, and you know, you always the show is always going to try and make you at least 
somewhat satisfied with who wins. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I don't know if it's just in the name or what, but the Natalies of Survivor or the Natalie Whites of Survivor um, are the outliers more than the rule. Well, I read a stat, um, was it a week or two ago, when Natalie got her 16th confessional at the time. She broke the record of the curse of the Natalie, because I think, um, you know, we've, we've had, what, Natalie Bolton, Natalie Tenerelli, and Natalie White. that only ever had, like, about 15 confessionals on each season they were on or something ridiculous like that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. we've finally got it. But also, somebody pointed out to me, I uh, was at Oslet Noah, he said, if Natalie wins, that would be the very first time that we've had somebody with a name of a previous winner that wasn't Sandra uh, win win so like we've obviously had a Natalie win so this would be the same. that's a random stat for you just throwing it out there um, but okay going more on this season blood versus water quickly we've had this twist does it work with new players Marty Do you, is this a twist that you feel only works with returning players um, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of, of new players there's no question about it I mean I and listen, I agree with Spencer and part of, you know, Nicaragua's, you know, problem, if you will, was coming right after Heroes and Villains, which is all time favorite for me or right up there, top three anyway. Um, so you can have returning players um, perform really well and, and deliver a great season. But but I, I look at Spencer's season, for example, and I, I love that. I love having um new players especially if they're fans of the game and you know that they're going to play a game that's riveting and that's exciting and that's unpredictable and you know that that to me is really appealing so um it's just like we've talked about before it's just not as appealing to see new players that are not really big fans of the game and that are strategic and are really going to deliver on the promise of what what it, what we all think is a quote unquote great survivor season Spencer yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree with everything Marty said. I would add that with Blood vs. Water, it's, I think, part of the problem. It's not just that they happened, that this cast happened to be lackluster. I think new player Blood vs. Water is just, on a casting level, really constricting. That I mean, this has been spoken of many times, I think, in other podcasts by other people. But if you have, you know... If, if the chance that someone is compelling is 1 over X, then the chance that two people are both compelling is 1 over X squared. And add to that that if they're related, chances are the person who's been the big character has needed an audience and their family has been that audience. It could even be worse. Mm. So I think it's especially hard to find two good people who are both, you know, going to be compelling in a blood versus water scenario. And so I think that forced casting to choose maybe some, you know, oh, we really like this person. We'll just take uh, whatever is not going to be too bad. Or this person's okay and this person's okay. They're both okay. Um, you're not going to get as of the two outstanding characters, I think, in this format. Eliza said on an earlier recap this season that she felt it's almost like they cast for the Amazing Race and um, kind of the pairs that we have this season would be more suited to that show. I mean, I don't know if that yeah. kind of resonates that way or... Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I don't watch The Amazing Race, but it's, it's really, I mean, it doesn't focus as much on the, on the conflict, right, or on the, the like strategy, which has sort of been what has been lacking this season. And I mean, I, we have, I guess, we have conflict with John and Jacqueline having their little petty fight, but that for me, that's not as entertaining. I would much rather see a well put together, strategically developing character developing episode of Survivor. Well, it's. For yeah. for for the record, can we say I'd much rather have them, or I'd much rather watch them fight than I would make out on this season. <laughs> for the record, <laughs> that's a, that's a good honestly, point. if they if I saw them kiss each other one more time, I was ready to like throw something through my television. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. Uh, I'm glad I'm not watching, you know, at my house watching TV then. They, I might not have a TV at the end of the night. But uh, yeah, it's, I, I love the fact that whenever they're like making out, you've got Baylor creepily watching them. Like, I don't know if you've noticed that. Like, Baylor just likes to yeah. stare at them when they make out. She's like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> There was even a moment early in the season where Baylor was watching and they're like doing, they're kissing and they're like, oh, sorry, sorry, Baylor. And she's just watching. She's like, no, I love it. I love it. <laughs> 
<laughs> is she just used to seeing her mum with so many different men, or is she just wanting that for yeah. herself? Like, <laughs> she just likes seeing romance work, I guess. Yeah. Like, I wonder what that's like. I won't be in a sticky situation <laughs> anymore. Um, oh no, sticky situation joke. You guys are fans of a music. Very you? sticky situation. <laughs> oh no, I'm a big fan of. Uh, I am. I am. Marty could probably shed more light on this than I could, but I am all for Baylor being the next Chase Rice. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, you know, again, I know we're going to get to that. There's going to be some good opportunity to, to diss on people, and that's that's part of doing this. And everyone's got to have thick skin. But yeah, there's plenty plenty of those awards to give out. So there's no doubt about it. I feel like we need ready, a super set, group. roll, Marty. <laughs> What's that? Ready, set, roll. It's the name of Chase's uh, album. That, that's or right. Something. That's, yeah. that's true. That's true. Yes. Ready, he he yep, thought about dumber than a bag of hammers, but decided <laughs> to go with re- ready, set, <laughs> ready, set, roll. That would have gone down well, I think. Uh, buy Chase Rice's new album, Dumber Than a Bag of Hammers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they could form a super group, just get Whitney, and then we'd have Whitney, Baylor, and Chase, you know, the, the Survivor Country Band. It would work. As, as long as they're not on Survivor, do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish them the best. <laughs> yes. uh, it's, it's fascinating with it. Uh, one thing I'd like to get both your opinions on the challenges, uh, particularly in the recent weeks, because um, I think we've had the same immunity challenge for the last three or four weeks. They've just re- they've moved a few pieces around, basically. Um, Marty, modern challenges, are they getting worse? Do they need to come up with something a little bit more um, you know, unique in terms of what they can do? Um, I'm actually, you know, pretty, I don't really have a beef with the, uh, with the, um, with the challenges. I think they've done great, uh, on the challenges. I've been, uh, I haven't been disappointed that way. I was really disappointed in Nicaragua. Our challenges were not athletic. We, we didn't have a single, I don't think one single water challenge, you know, where you're actually in the ocean, like not one like that. Um, so it was, you know, we had some physical, but not that many, um, so no, I, I actually kind of like, I like the, uh, challenges and they've had some good, uh, I like the ones where you're doing endurance challenges, I think are always really interesting. And, you know, Jane, as much as I hated her, did pretty well in a lot of these challenges. And if you look at Keith, he's kind of the Jane, you know, of, of the season a little bit, except without the personality flaws. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I, I, I actually, I don't, I don't have, uh. I don't have a big beef. Well, is, is there something with Nicaragua that they can't do water challenges? Because your season was Nicaragua. This is in Nicaragua. Uh, Redemption Island, they didn't do water challenges either. Is is there, yeah. is there something with the, the country that d- doesn't allow them to? Weren't the waters for, like... For Nicaragua, rough. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Is there something with the water, Spencer? I heard that the waters were too rough, so they had to build a pool for you guys that Fabio peed in, the, <laughs> <laughs> the pool that you used for all those challenges. Yeah, it was the the. Uh, and for the record, I would never go back to Nicaragua if my life depended on it. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was awful. Um, but the the beach was brown, the water was brown, the surf was not. You know, the water just was not very good looking water. So I don't think they could find a good place to have those challenges. There you go, season thirty two All Stars. Marty gets the invite. Uh, Nicaragua, you're filming at it? No, I'll pass. Thank you. Uh, uh- <laughs> <laughs> No, thank you. Uh, Spencer, the challenges, I mean, what's your thoughts on kind of these post-merge challenges that they do? Hey, Marty said it better than I could. I mean, I, I like the cha- I like endurance challenges a lot as well. I think it's interesting to see how people respond to that kind of pressure. I'm all about, you know, I think Survivor really is about seeing how people respond to a ridiculous situation. So challenges that take that further and say, how do you respond to this kind of stress? Um, I like I like I like challenges that reward mental focus and that sort of are a level playing field like the last immunity challenge where it's it's about, you know, balance, concentration, um, just sort of keeping your head in it. So I'm, I'm all for that. Speaking of reward, um, this season has a very big trend of, hey, let's win a reward and give it up and then promptly get voted out. There seems to be a curse that if you give up reward, you're going to get voted out. Spencer, what, what, what do you think this is? Why are these just down to the new players don't know how to, you know, play the game, so to speak, that they're giving yeah. it up so quickly? I don't know. I mean, I think I think there's I, a. I don't think it's as bad as as a lot of people think. I think there's some merit to giving these things up. 
B, I think that there's a bit of a snowball effect where, okay, she did it. Now I kind of feel like a jerk if I don't. Um, and, and it just sort of cascades and makes people want to do it more and more. And C, I think that this isn't necessarily as new an idea as people might think. I think it just sort of has been, it, it's exploded into being done this season. I mean, on my season, Jeff actually offered to give up rewards multiple times. Um, you know, there was a point, it, this didn't make air, but we, me, Tony, and Jeremiah won a spa day. And Tony said, oh man, you know, I, I don't need a spa day. I'm, I'm good. I, you know, I, I, in Jersey City, I never do anything like this. I was, I was hoping maybe one of the ladies would win it. <laughs> um, and so Jeff said, well, why don't you give it up, Tony? And Tony was like, oh, no, 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 I'll do it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm glad he did because that was sort of the turning point in my game. Um, but, uh, yeah, and, and then, you know, after that, even the reward challenge where Jeffra and Tasha and Jeremiah and I went to those caves, Jeff asked any, if any of us wanted to give up the reward to cast because, again, this didn't make air, but Cass was basically in tears crying because she felt really bad that she hadn't been on a reward. Um, so this isn't a totally new thing, I would say. It's just actually made air this time. Matty? Yeah, I think, I think that um, I think where it doesn't work, I think that people are a little delusional if they think that just because of your benevolence and giving up the award to somebody else, it's actually going to buy you something. Where I've seen it work is where you know for sure that you don't want two or three other people being together for an entire afternoon talking about things. So in, in a sense, you know, it, it's much more logical when you're just trying to make sure that certain people aren't together or that you get to spend the afternoon together with somebody that's critical. So I, I see it making more sense there, but the fact that, that someone's actually going to you know, make a decision down the road on whether they're going to vote you in or out because you gave them uh, a reward challenge. I think that's that's a bunch of baloney. Well, one thing that I miss is um, we saw it like last in last week's double episode because they're so focused when the reward challenges they divide them into teams. We we very rarely get now that an individual wins reward and then they get to choose. And that I mean in itself is strategic, isn't it? Because you, I mean, we've seen people in the past, um, you know, lose the game because they've chosen the wrong person. So I mean. Marty, do you miss that aspect of it, that we don't have these individual rewards where it also has implications on the game as well as who's going to go get a spa? Yes and no. I mean, it, it, I think it depends on the individual season and the cast of characters and what's happening, and I think they pick and choose whether or not to introduce that kind of dynamic to create just further tension or to also just, you know throw the dynamics of the group together but I, I, one way or the other I'm not, I don't have strong feelings on it one way or the other Spencer might have some thoughts no, I mean, I think I, I, I just agree that it, it can matter in, in determining you know who is on that reward and who isn't and, and just the dynamics of that but um, I don't know I mean, I, I think uh, it's rewards just by and large aren't as big a factor as they're made into. I, I think that oftentimes the show will just narrate things through the scope of a reward to tell a story, whether or not that's how the story unfolded. I want to get your thoughts on all the people left and talk about some moves from that, obviously, um, throughout this one. But just one, one last twist, I just want to get your thoughts on this season. Exile Island, um, has this been a waste of time being brought back, Spencer? Hmm, I don't know. It, I, I think it, it has somewhat, but not in and of itself or being Exile Island. I liked Exile Island at first. I liked, I thought it gave us some great moments, you know, the Exile Alliance in token chains, um, coaches, <laughs> monastic approach, um, some really good moments when it was done well and really thought out. But I haven't really liked the execution this season. It's, it's not really, scenic it's not it's not anything to to really appreciate visually um and it just sort of feels thrown together last minute and i also think that i i, I feel like there's something kind of cheap about the idols on exile i mean it that's, it's been yeah. it's been I, you know you get to just look for the these idols in complete seclusion and they just seem really easy to find yeah. um i i don't think that john mish and and these other people are just super talented idol finders i think it's more likely that it's just a little easier than maybe it has been in the past to find them there and you know 
I almost get the sense that the show wants to inject drama into the show via these idols to make up for having a lackluster cast, and I don't think it always works. Marty, you were nodding your head big time there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's 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 the only thought I had is what Spencer said. You know, it really just you know, I, they never showed anything. Like if people are going to go to exile when they used to before, and it was awful and it just sucked. I mean, there was a little bit of an interesting story in that, but I think that exile this year, you know, this season is just all about here's an easy idol, here you yeah. go, here's an idol. You're almost guaranteed to get the idol if there is one out there. Well, here's a question for yeah. you on that. Um, John's been voted out with an idol. Um, they can play their idol, what, last time is at Final Five. So do they then now rehide John's idol, do you feel? And um, obviously then that means whoever goes to Exile Island um, next week, if they have it, is going to be, you know, I suppose, a, a good position. I mean, Marty, is this something that you feel will happen? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think these are the areas where production has flexibility in terms of where they want to guide um, some of the outcome, right? I mean, you know, the, these Jeff and the team don't directly do things that manipulate the story, but in these cases, you know, there's nobody that says you have to have an idol out there the next time. Yeah. Um, there is no rule around that, so I think it's more thinking about you know what's the potential impact to the storyline and to the outcome, and getting us sort of the best and most exciting you know last episode. I think is what it boils down to. If I had to guess, uh, is there going to be one? Um, I, I don't know. I think it's a total flip of the coin depending on who goes to Exile Island, whether they put one out there or not. If it's going to give uh, somebody an opportunity that they believe is going to be gone, like I don't know, like if you told me, I don't know, uh, Natalie's going to go to Exile Island, and would they put an idol? Mm, yeah, probably. Mm. Spencer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I definitely do agree that there's a definite gray area in the rules that um this you know really like all these idols i don't think all of them should have been planted necessarily as far as how previous seasons have gone usually if there's multiple idols you don't replant any idols until all of the idols have been played um but i mean this it, it's i think this is just a case study in the idea that idols can't manufacture a good season that there have been idols all over the place they've been played unsuccessfully played successfully all kinds of things involving idols and and yet the drama hasn't always been there um i have to think no right i mean it's the last time an idol can be played is final 5 it is the final 5 Natalie has one. I mean, I just I, I feel as if an idol shouldn't be planted, but Marty's right that it really is up to them. Mm. It's going to be fascinating to see how it goes out. On the idols, John, as I said, got voted out with one. Spencer, the obvious question, why didn't John play his idol? If you are in the final <laughs> five, you have an idol. Do you play it at final five no matter what, even if you've just got a sniff that you might be going home? At final five or final Sorry, six? Sorry, final six. I'll backtrack and correct myself. Final six, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, final si final five, of, of course. course. Yeah, every time. Um, but final six, you know, I mean, if I, if I think there's a 50% chance I go home, then yeah, for sure, I play it. Um, but if there's, I don't know, a 15, 20% chance, then it's a little more of a gray area. And um, there is a point at final six where um, there's a chance I think I'm going home, but I'm going to save it and take my shots. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, you know, that's for me. And for John, you know, I think, to be fair, it, it's easy to say he should have been past that point where he should play it, where, you know, especially because he's pretty good at challenges, there's a decent chance he can win final five immunity. Um it's it's like a James situation in China where he has two at final seven. You know, technically it would be nice to save it and play one at six and five, but if you have any, if you have a real, you know, substantive uh, doubt, then it makes a lot of sense to play it. Yeah. So you know, it, it all comes down to where John thought he was. And I don't know the exact percent, but it, it, you know, where he thought he was on which side of that line. And, um, you know, it, I think it speaks to how well Natalie played it, that he was on the side of the line of, I have less risk of going home than what I would need to play an idol. 
Um, and Natalie was just really, really talented, I thought, at representing someone who was not going in there to blindside her alliance, who just wanted to stick with the plan. She said very convincingly, oh, I'm so glad I have bloody immunity. Um, and I, I just thought it was really convincing. I thought she did a good job representing what she needed to to pull that off. This is why Spencer shines, man. You know, I mean, he's... He's talking algorithms and formulas that I'm having trouble, you know, following. You know, this is, you know, he was doing like regression formulas on odds and probabilities. On a multivariable you know I mean? regression, if you, you know, take take the d- derivative of the of the chance of going home with respect to having an idol. This, this is a, about to graduate, folks. About to graduate. Uh, so, so, I mean, Marty, do you, do you play it at Final Six? I probably would, yeah. I mean, uh, but that's me, and that's probably just because I'm feeling, and I would be feeling that uh, I'd be under pressure uh, at all times. I always felt, even you know, in the in the few situations where I had control of the tribe, I I never ever felt comfortable. I would probably do it. I want to use a big word. I just want to use the word variable here to sound smart. But um, the one variable I suppose you could factor into this. Wow, that's the smartest thing I've ever said on this show. Uh, Jacqueline, of course, is still in the game. So I mean, of course, you, you still got his couple there. So I mean, is there maybe an aspect of that to it right. that um, oh if I play my idol then Jacqueline's going home or you know that's obviously got to be factored into it I think it's a factor I mean I think the fact that Jacqueline is there makes him less because if, you, you know, if it's just you then if you don't play it and then you final five immunity, it kind of went to waste but that Jacqueline is there it's not going to waste if you win final five immunity you give it to her, and you're ensuring both of you, which is amazing for you. Um, and so I definitely see the appeal in saving it. I mean, if they had both survived this tribal council, and then one of them had won immunity, one of them is guaranteed final three, yep. which is tempting. So I see why you might hold on to it. Here's the question then, and this is, I suppose, only relates now to Baylor and Missy because they're the only couple left in the game. Is it in the best interest of Baylor and Missy to sacrifice one of them going into the final tribal, given that only one can win and that maybe if both of them are in the final three, that um, that's going to cost them perhaps a win rather than help them? Um, that's tough because with the way I see it... Um, by by some logic, yes, you want to have Missy there who can actually get votes and take Baylor out and have her give you a guaranteed jury vote and then lobby for you, Ponderosa. But I think it, it would be different if, if, it were, if they were maybe a little more liked. I don't know how liked they are. And if they were more liked, I think that logic would win out, and you would want Baylor on the jury and Missy in the final three. Mm-hmm. But the way it is, I think that there's a very limited number of people. And as sad as this is, I think if Keith makes it to the end, he wins over them. So I think they really need to go with the person that they have a shot of beating and I think that's probably Jacqueline because I think Natalie or Keith, they just can't risk him being there at the end. Marty, what, what do you think about that scenario? Um, I think I agree with most of it, but do you honestly believe that Keith, I mean, you, that Spencer's probably, again, run some formulas on voting probabilities and the rest of it, you know, came here, but <laughs> Keith could possibly pull it off just because he's got uh, he hasn't really pissed anybody off, right? Which is always kind of disappointing to me to to have the outcome be really predicated on who who was least offensive as opposed to who actually. I mean, let's be honest here. Keith hasn't known which side was up during this entire game. Yeah. He has no clue. Mm-hmm. Uh, right, and the fact right. that he's spitting camp all the time is driving <laughs> me crazy. So um, <laughs> um, no, I so go ahead. Is a better player than Keith, hands down. Um, but my read on the jury right now is that Keith would win. Yeah. Um, he has Wes guaranteed. He hasn't pissed people off. And it's not just that he's the least offensive, or it's not just that he hasn't pissed people off, but Missy and Baylor are actually. Uh, it seems like they've really made enemies. I mean, with Reed, you know, getting into that huge fight with them, I feel like Reed would vote Keith, and I feel like that means Josh might vote Keith. Um, 
and I feel like Alec being super tight with Wes might vote Keith. Mm. Um, so I think it's it's scary, but it, it's it's kind of I can really see how Keith would beat Missy and Baylor. Yeah. Um, ba- and you know, look at the exit interviews. It's I, I'm not going off of who I think deserves it because I definitely think Keith is the least deserving player left <laughs> as far as knowing what he's doing. But I, it's going off of what I think the players there perceive. And if you look at the exit interviews for Baylor, for instance, the words that are used to describe her are always negative. If you look at, you know, Gordon Holmes, every exit interview, he, he does word association of, of who, what word do you think of with this person? And if you just run down the line of every jury member with Baylor, it's just all terrible things. So it's, it, it's sort of a situation where I, I can't imagine anyone would be saying that if Baylor ends up winning this season. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And, um, I mean, it's kind of countering my point that I made. Um, Baylor seems to be the perennial take to the end to get zero votes. So, therefore, um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not too sure with Missy in terms of how well she's um, respected because I, I, I feel as though Missy has a few people there that would vote for her. But, I, yeah, like as you were saying with Baylor, yeah. I mean, Baylor, you would have to say, out of all the five... Um, is the least likely to win um, out of... Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, honestly, she's drawing dead. I think she's she's getting beaten in any permutation of of a final three. Um, and that's why I see the three people with the real shot at it as, as crazy as it sounds, being Jacqueline, Keith, and Natalie. Okay, that's interesting. Marty, I'll get your thoughts on kind of that. Like, you can talk about Baylor if you want to, but I mean, I suppose it kind of can tag us into now, yeah, who, who has a shot? I know you mentioned you think Natalie's going to win, but is there anybody else you can see besides Natalie winning the game, Marty? No, I mean, listening to Spencer, I have, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I've only watched one uh, exit interview this entire season, so I have not been following that and really trying to gauge where I think the jury is going to land. Um, but a lot, of, everything Spencer just said makes a lot of sense. I think, especially when it applies to Baylor. Um, but Jacqueline, I mean, I, I could see Jacqueline getting some votes for sure. I mean, if you look at it pragmatically, I, and again, I don't know what the exit interviews would would indicate when it comes to her. Um, and it makes sense what you're saying about Keith, but you know, if you were, I mean, in my mind, honestly, I mean, to see <laughs> Keith walk away with a million dollars, just you know, it's it's so just, funny because like, all of about two or three weeks ago, I'm like almost making bets that Keith wasn't going to win this game. I'm like, if Keith wins, I will quit this show. Like now, nah, like, but now I'm like thinking, well, to me, he's almost in the box seat because, he, as he said, if he gets to the end, how is he not winning this game? <laughs> Well, it, just imagine it cutting from Keith saying, stick to the plan, and then his crazy, <laughs> maniacal laugh. And then the winner of Survivor, San Juan del Sur, Keith. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and Marty quit Survivor. Marty's done. <laughs> imagine. I mean, seriously. I, 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 you Do know, you, Marty, would you say... <laughs> Would you would you say worst winner ever if that happens? <laughs> yes, probably. Wow. <laughs> well, it's interesting actually because um, I'll just leap ahead a little bit here to one of our listener questions. Um, Jane, well, actually, one of our old listeners, James Pickering, says uh, to you, Marty, do you think, and actually it's directed at you too, Spencer, similarities between Fabio's game and the game Keith is playing? And wait, Fabio and who? I'm sorry. So Fabio and Keith. So do you feel you see similarities in Fabio and Keith? Um, no, I totally disagree. And and again, I'm sure Keith is a really nice guy in real life, and I'm sure that you know he's probably a smart guy in his own right. But a lot of people that watch I see didn't understand that Fabio is actually a very very smart guy. I don't know if I'll just ask you tester thing, but if you were to ask me, I think he he tested probably super high. It's just that they gave him the Spicoli edit. You know what I mean? He just looked like he was fast times at Ridgemont High. But he was actually really, really <laughs> super smart guy and he actually really understood stuff about the personal banks. 
um, that were right place. I, I think he was masterful, and I think he was actually manipulative. You just you just didn't get to see it, you know, on my season, and I think that sort of helped them in the end in the way that they told the story. So, no, for me, Keith. I mean, here's well, there is one, there is one similar. Drive me crazy, but when you watch after any tribal and the people go back to camp, the people that have no idea what just happened and the people that have no idea why the vote went the way that it did usually tells you they're just not in the game. They have no idea. They're not influencing the game and they're not understanding the dynamics of what's happening. And I would say that nine times out of ten, Keith has come back to camp and has had no clue what just happened. No clue. <laughs> That's a good point. Oh, I gotta love him. Vincent, I mean, do you see any you know, similarities? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is actually one of the things I was I wanted to talk about with Marty because we I feel bad we've been agreeing so much in this podcast that um that's the one thing that I think we we have a different perspective on just because Marty knows so much more than I do. And watching Nicaragua, I was kind of disappointed with Fabio as a winner because he was given that edit and he didn't seem to know you know he there were there were voting confessionals of him being you know uh, i guess this is still the plan i don't know <laughs> um and so I, I i came away from it wondering if he really did know what he was doing and so it's it's good it's reassuring to hear that you know from someone who knows better than any viewers that he had his head in the game despite being convinced uh, that Marty was a, a chess grandmaster <laughs> with, with the name of a <laughs> Argentinian tennis player. <laughs> uh, the the one thing that I will say to that is that it also played in Fabio's favor. The one thing that he got away with was he not only didn't know where the votes were going necessarily on any given tribal, but he also did not vote <laughs> with the majority like almost ever. And yeah. would come back after tribal, and it, but it never bit him in the ass because whoever he voted for was was non confrontational and it, it had zero impact on his game, and and that typically doesn't happen when you don't vote with the majority. That's usually a pretty bad sign, and and yeah. somehow yeah. he just managed to skate by, and it was never confrontational or, or conflicting. Sure, and I'm of course I'm being somewhat of a hypocrite because <laughs> if voting in the minority all the time means you're a bad player that i'm pretty much the worst player ever <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah i i, I you know I, I definitely there's a lot of value i agree in in how you respond to where you vote whether it's in the majority or the minority and i think fabio probably responded a lot better than i did at times you know blowing up at Cass and whatnot i'm a big fabio fan i uh, uh, we've had him on a couple of times and he's a hoot and a half to talk to and um i think he's, he's, he's a nice guy and that's actually one of the other listening questions we got here for you spencer um spencer another guy called spencer spencer frasad actually says uh you recently said Fabio is your least favorite winner how do you feel about Marty voting for him <laughs> yeah I mean that's one thing I was always I always wondered about is because just the perception I got was that he really just and, and didn't know you know up from down um and so, you know, in in light of that, it's it, it makes me rethink it. It makes me want to, you know, rewatch Nicaragua mm. because I have before ranked probably as the winner, which is a stark contrast to the vision I get from you. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, also, which is kind of sad, I mean, because I have revisited that, you know, those decisions. Um, when you look at what our options were, you had Chase... You know, sorry, not not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Then yeah, yeah. you had Sash, who actually played a super strategic game, but it was kind of a sh- kind of made you feel dirty, and yeah, it wasn't yeah. like a strategic game, like a Tony strategic game. It was this like you know, just a little slimy. I actually, you know, very quick, brief story. But after the finale, I, I actually loved Sash, and I thought he played an amazing game and. And you could argue that he should have won it. Uh, and I got to know his family really well, and his siblings, and his parents. And I can't remember what it was. I said something terrible about him at the, at the, on the final. Episode. Yeah. And then we met yeah. up at the party. His family, his family was just—they were shocked. You know, they were just like, "How could you have said that about Sash?" And 
what a terrible thing. And, and I, oh I didn't God. even remember. I was like, what are you guys talking about? What did I say? I don't, you know. And, and his mother and his sister were like, you said that Slash was, Slash was slimy or that he was you know, a weasel. Oh, you called him a weasel. And Slash was standing right there. And I, and I thought first, I said, did I really say that? And Slash was like, yeah, you did. And I said, well, because, uh, because he was. He was a weasel. And, and Sash just started laughing, and his whole family, I think, finally got it. Like, yeah, I mean, come on. It, he was, you know. And yeah. so it was a yeah. tough call. He, he, could, he could have won it. He could have won it. Hmm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I definitely... I, that makes a lot of sense. I'm just lucky that Wu's family was more gracious to me and, and less confrontational. I was, uh, after the finale, I went up to Wu's dad, or Wu's dad came up to me, and I thought I was about to get my, my head lopped off. Um, but he was, he was nothing but, but kind. And, you know, I, because I, I did feel bad about what I said to Wu. Um, whereas you're, you know, with Sash, that was warranted, it sounded like. And with me, calling Wu a dog wasn't completely warranted. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you probably just had a better better read on things and a better head on your shoulders. I It's hard for me. I, I was a new Survivor fan watching that season, and it would be interesting to revisit and see if that changes any of my thoughts on, on Fabio in particular and the season in general. Hmm. Fascinating. I, I, I re when I rewatch Nicaragua, I mean, obviously, when you do a rewatch, you always try and focus on the winner and kind of, you know, look at things that maybe you've never sort of seen before. But I never forget with Fabio's, and I'm sure every player at some point in Survivor has a confessional where they say, I'm going to win this game. Um, and they only air certain of them. But I never forget, like, going into Nicaragua in that very first episode, and Fabio is one of the first things he says. He's like, yeah, I'm going to win this game. People don't think I'm going to win this game, but I'm going to win this yeah. game. And you're like, straight away, like, there it is. <laughs> It was right when they started calling him Fabio, and he's like, whatever, call me whatever you want when I'm winning the million dollars. Yep. And it's yep. that the attitude and that demeanor. And he does have, like, a gift for letting things roll off his back mm -hmm. and for for not getting into those heated confrontations that I'm all too uh, likely to get in. Um, so that's yeah. I, I, I could probably take a page out of Fabio's playbook if I wanted to improve. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That attribute is probably one of the most important ever. That's why we were saying earlier, you know, one in a million to see somebody like Tony win it, right? It is yeah. very, yes. very yes. hard. You know? uh, it's always best to keep your mouth shut, and that's a very, very hard thing to do when you're on Survivor. And this is where yeah. Spencer sees it. Like, it's so good because, you know, it, it has all these aspects, and someone like Tony wins and you know will we ever see that again who knows we're not seeing it this season so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no no winner there's not going to be a Tony like winner for a while I think mm, it's it's kind of interesting just how that all played out with it all uh, we're going to get to some more of these listener questions because we did get a few in um, and obviously we've got our final five to get to in terms of um, sort of closing out with the, the predictions but um, just quickly uh, mention Missy's injury the whole ankle situation I read Jeff Probst's um, interview with Dalton Ross in terms of that had this happened earlier in the season she would have been pulled from the game. There is no way she would have stayed in the game. It's because she's, it's what, like four or five days left in the game. That's why she's still in it. Uh, I mean, Spencer, I, I guess really the question is, Missy, can she pull that for sympathy and pull that in her favour? Should she make the jury like, I stayed strong by staying here with a broken ankle at the end? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't. I, I, I'm skeptical to think that she'll get much sympathy. Um, you know, they're really driving it home as far as uh, showing her being carried to the voting booth and showing her like hobbling behind <laughs> as people are walking to tribal. She's still there. Um, the they're really getting the sympathy out of the viewers, but I don't think that you know Josh and Reed and and all these people who already really didn't like Missy are going to get that sense of we they feel bad for her just based on hearing about her situation, you know, when they see her at tribal council. Mm -hmm. um, potentially these last couple of jurors might feel bad for her because they've lived with it. Um, but I don't see her getting that much sympathy. I feel as if she's already burned a lot of bridges that can't be rebuilt by, you know, a, a broken ankle or whatever it might be. Maddie? 
Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think it just forms part of the storyline. When you're out there and you're playing the game, it's it's very Darwin esque. I mean, it's you know, it's the the, <laughs> the fittest are going to win both mentally and physically. And when you see people get hurt or whatever, you're you're looking at it, you feel kind of bad, but you're like, okay, you know, better better him than me, mm-hmm. you know. So I don't know how much sympathy it really buys you. Only so much sympathy for the the Jimmy Johnsons of Survivor. <laughs> Not, not uh, enjoying their their stay at the Survivor Resort. <laughs> That's correct. That is correct. I, um, there's of course a famous saying that if you're looking for sympathy, it's in the dictionary between shit and syphilis. So um, <laughs> that um, could be something that somebody could turn around and say to her at the uh, final tribal council. Uh, Natalie, I just want to touch on Natalie. We're, I mean, we've, you both spoke of your admiration for Natalie and her chances of winning this game. Do either of you feel though that there could be some Natalie backlash from the jury, or do you think that the jury is very pro Natalie Spence? I'll start with you on that one. Um, uh, I think that there could be some backlash, possibly from someone like Jacqueline or John, if Jacqueline ends up on the jury. Um, but I tend to think that Natalie will win if she makes it to the end. Um, I think that Survivor, even with this cast, has tended enough toward rewarding strategic play that Natalie's in good shape if she makes it to the end. And I want her to. Um, she is not my top winner pick, but I do want her to, and I do think that she wins if she makes it to the end. Marty? Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, they kind of bugged the hell out of me at the beginning of the season, to be totally honest, uh, the two, the two sisters. So I was not, I was not crazy about them to, uh, at the <laughs> beginning, but, um, but she has definitely grown on me and the episode before this episode, I was kind of, I didn't understand why she did what she did because I, I thought, how the hell is she going to explain this? And if you looked at the numbers, it, it just, it, it didn't make sense. I mean, it was great to, to, to vote differently than the group did, but I thought, how the hell is she going to rationally explain it to these guys and get away with it? So, um, I think hats off to her. I think we've seen a lot more, I think she's she's really smart. So I think out of all the players, I'm kind of looking at the way she's played the game. Other than you know Josh and uh, you know top three for me in terms of who I would have liked to have seen. I think Josh, Jeremy, and and now Natalie. So um, that 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 would be my pick for sure. I'd be I'd be most satisfied if at this point in time Natalie took it all. I think a lot of people would agree with you. She's got a very strong fan base out there. Uh, some listener questions now, some ones that we haven't got to, then we'll get into our final five here. Now, thanks to everybody who sent us in these. Of course, you can do it each week, Survivor Oz at hotmail.com.au or check us out on social media and see who we've got on the show to get your questions in. And I'm going to tell you who's on next week because, my God, it's not that this week isn't big enough. I'm not trying to get rid of these two already, but um, you're going to love next week's as well. Uh, Stephanie Panaratos uh, sends in a question. This kind of harks back to something we were talking about right at the beginning of this episode. Uh, my question is for both Marty and Spencer addressing tribe swaps. Spencer benefited, whereas Marty didn't. What can you do if a tribe swap doesn't go your way? Now, I don't know if we asked this to Marty first or... <laughs> it, I guess it applies more to his situation because it really did go my way, so I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> there you go, Marty. The floor's yours. <laughs> You know, there's there's not much you can do, especially when the numbers are not in your favor. Um, and in particular, in my season, there was such a deep divide between young and old. And no matter, you know, all you can do is suck it up. You got to suck it up, and you got to look for cracks, and you got to look for openings, and you got to try to figure out whether there's, you know, a weakness that you can exploit. But you're really kind of powerless. I mean, it's a t- Horrible, awful, awful thing uh, to have, and uh, you know, you can get lucky. And in my case, you know, doing this, that, or the other, just to get me to the merge. And then once you get to the merge, if you're lucky enough to do that, then you know, then then it's wide open, and and hopefully you get an opportunity to sort of reset the table. But it's uh, it's one of those unfortunate things uh, in the game, and I had no bitterness over it whatsoever. But it is what it is, and you gotta you gotta live with it and. Hopefully you, you're a fighter and you continue. That's what this whole game is, in my mind, a lot of it. It's just being a fighter and never giving up and all that good stuff. So, you know, what you do with a hand of 
Very true. And Spencer, in terms of uh, never giving up and yeah. getting what you dealt with, um, you did a lot of that throughout your season, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, yeah, I, I, I tried. I mean, I do think that there's a sense you know, along the lines of what Mom was saying of timing where you have to, you have to, uh, there's not that much you can do, but when you have something you can do, you just have to play it really well and time it right. And the reason, you know, I succeeded in a tribe ball is because the brains that were there, Asha and I, just sort of sat back and let the beauties come to us and then figured out what to do based on them exposing their weaknesses. And I think Marty similarly timed things really well when he played it really delicately and made that deal with Sash to give him his idol, which was an incredibly hard thing to do, I'm sure. I mean, I, I can't imagine too many people would jump out on a limb and do that. Um, but it's, I, I think you just have to really balance it when you get in the wrong side of a, of a tribe swap. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and, well, uh, too many people. Um, Eric Reichenbach. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I know it's a different situation, but I just felt like being mean to Eric. Hello, Eric. <laughs> we love you on the show. Um, so, thank you very much. <laughs> I was don't put me Don't put me in that category. No, 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 no. Of course not. Of course not. I just, for some reason, Eric pumped into my mind, and I'm just like, yep, cool. We'll just go with that name. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, Jessica Malay. Now, Jessica's got a couple of questions here, which I know we covered, Spencer, with you on your initial interview with us so i will say jessica if you want a couple of those answered download that one with spencer he answers them in that one but the one that she adds here um if you were to return on a blood versus water season who would you play with hmm i think i would most likely play with um my sister um taryn who who visited me um my mom would be a possibility um Maybe at some point down the road, my girlfriend. Um, oh, so there's, there's a girlfriend now, is there, Spencer? <laughs> there is, there is. Uh, all, those, all the lim- women just tuned out. Like, ah, stuff this. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all, the, all the 12-year-old girls just tuned out. <laughs> Going um, back to Lucky but... Malcolm now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Malcolm was the better choice anyway, but... Um, yeah, I, it would it would be it, someone. I don't know. To be honest, the blood versus water, I would have mixed feelings about. It's just a really different game, and it would be it would be so hard to play with a loved one. I don't know. Mar- would you get excited to do that? Who would you bring, Marty? Um. So I was uh, I was actually in the running. So and the two people ah. that they cycled through were they first looked at my son who's you know roughly your age too and uh and uh he was actually just at university of chicago uh interviewing for his uh post-grad work spencer so um so they looked at him and then and then my wife and uh i think it would be really really hard i have a sister that i would think would probably be somebody good to play with but boy as i played out the scenarios of what that would be like it, it, most of the scenarios that I was coming up with were were not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. You know, yeah, it's it's. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you you know what's kind of sad is that Marty, I feel you're in this group of survivor purgatory where you are on yes. literally every returning player shortlist, and you're always literally cut at the end. You're with the Troyzans, the Terry Dietzes, the Shane Powers, the Natalie Boltons. You're just stuck in Survivor Purgatory of, you're there, but you then just miss out at the end. I mean, what do you have to do, Marty? <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, I think a lot of it is, you know, a lot of it is luck. I think, you know, we were all extremely lucky to get on, even though I would argue, especially me, you know, and part of my downfall, I think, is you, you're extremely delusional. I mean, because one, once you're out there and you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm actually playing this game that is consumed me. And then you think you're, like, invincible. You think, you know, you're you're going to run this thing, you know, absolutely outright. So, but I... But what I guess I'm getting at is that at the end of the day, it's got a lot to do with luck and how you fit into the format. And frankly, you know, my opportunity, if and when it ever comes up, is going to be very, very narrow. You know, it's going to be definitely older, older guy, um, uh, you know, sort of the educated asshole, basically. You know, it's like, who's, who, you know, I'm fitting into that category where they happen to need an old guy that's going to be a jerk. 
and that people will love to probably hate. I, I, you know, they so, need to give. You know, they need someone to give out dumber than a bag of hammers award. <laughs> We can have that as an Oscar category next year. The Marty Piombo Dumber is a Bag of Hammers yes. Oscar category. You shouldn't have. Yeah, you should. You shouldn't have told Probst you didn't like Nicaragua, Marty. I think that pissed him off. Yeah, I, I was going to say earlier, I don't think that was probably the smartest thing to do when he called me before the finale. And uh, I, I think they take that kind of personally. Yeah. So, uh, Survivor, uh, older asshole season coming soon. Um <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica, for that question. Cody Ross, um, well, actually, funnily, we've mentioned Dumber Than a Bag of Hammers because one of his questions is, who from San Juan del Sur would win the Dumber Than a Bag of Hammers award? <laughs> Man, it's, like I said, it's totally up for grabs. There probably have to be multiple awards, but <laughs> right now, right now in the running, you know, it could be, you know, Drew or his brother for sure. Um but Keith's comment at Tribal of uh, stick to the plan right now, it, you know, has that the dumber than a bag of hammer award has got that all over it. Spencer, Marty, you have to see a. Uh, there is a screenshot from the last episode of Alec uh, on the jury. I'm going to send it to you both. You, I've got it. You absolutely must see. It is <laughs> that. That should be the the like frame of the award. It's. <laughs> <laughs> it's too much. Um, you have to send that. To I'm, I'm going to send it to you me. both yes. right now on Facebook. Keep talking, Spencer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Well, is that what is this? My dumber than yeah. A bag who of who gets award? the Spencer Bledsoe dumber than a bag of hammers award? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, sh- it's so hard to overlook the stick to the plan. Um, I, although underratedly dumb was the fact that John and Jacqueline didn't talk for like six, seven hours over some fight in a game for a million dollars. I mean, that that is <laughs> pretty dumb. Um, I think, I think you. I- almost go with uh i mean if you're talking just about who's the dumbest it's keith um but the dumbest with a huge edit who isn't always perceived as dumb has to be john i mean john towards the end was getting to be a bit much with the um the pleading with jacqueline like oh i don't want to talk about strategy right now leave me alone (laughs) like come on that's he's He's the most overratedly smart or I, underratedly. Dumb. I agree with that because I, there's so many aspects of watching John's game that, yeah, he's getting it, and yeah, I can see, but, but there's so many things that he's done and said in this game that are so stupid. <laughs> like, I mean, yes. if you actually look at a lot of, he's just almost like a puppy dog, and I honestly think he's whipped in that relationship. I mean, I wouldn't mind being whipped by Jacqueline, let's be honest, but like, it's it's like. Seriously, what, go back and watch some of the things that he does, and John's really not all there sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I can see the whipped thing. He was really the jack. He basically didn't even do that much. He just said like, "Leave me alone," and then the rest of the day, he's just like, "Come on." Oh, uh, Jacqueline, don't be mad at me. Yes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was... <sighs> Unbelievable. I think we need to have a, a similar award then, the Spencer Bledsoe, oh, you're not winning the game now, Cass Award. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Cass, zero chance of winning the game. Yes. With the hammer. Yes, with the Spencer Bledsoe look that we all grew and loved uh, throughout the season. Uh, I've yeah, just- that was... Times. I've just sent the uh, <laughs> image to both of you on Facebook, which for people listening means yeah, Mar- you're gonna love it, means Marty. nothing to them right now. But look at it; it's, it's available. We'll put it on the recap there. Uh, Cody also says, "Who has the best hairdo of San Juan del Sur?" <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dude, I just looked at that. Absolutely, he had to have like at least eighteen ounces of air conditioner, <laughs> hair conditioner in that too. Man, that's impressive. But uh, yeah, I mean, it looks like he, you know. That, it looks to me like he smoked a bag of weed. I mean, it looks like he's completely out of it. Yeah, he looks more st- stoned than Wu has ever been in that photo. <laughs> oh, wow. And 
which, which is a feat. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, all right, thanks, Cody. Uh, John Sol- Salons, um, we kind of touched on this a bit before. This is sort of not related to this season. Uh, but he asked you, Marty, I'd be curious to know if your perception of Chase has changed since that final tribal council <laughs> and after watching the season. You were pretty harsh on him at the time, but I feel like you might have just been trying to make Fabio look good. <laughs> Um, well, you know, I was, somebody recently posted, he's he's been successful and I actually posted a, a congratulations note to him on the success of his album. He was just on Jimmy Kimmel Live. I mean, you know, the guy's doing really well. And, uh, and so I put something up there congratulating him. And of course, somebody had to get up there immediately and say something about, dumber than a bag of hammers you know and uh and i just said hey listen you know that was just completely taken out of context you know really exaggerated um but but no i i still i i still firmly believe if you look back at my season chase you know deserve uh to win that award i wouldn't i wouldn't retract that i don't think at all uh we should point out you're saying the success uh number three on the charts in america i believe number one in u.s country but number three on the overall charts which uh it's bloody brilliant. Good on you, Chase. So killing it, yeah, Kill, awesome. killing it there. There you the go. Moment. There you go. Uh, help. He's he's got to be other than like Elizabeth Hasselbeck, the most famous to I reckon, yeah. You know, come out of Survivor. Absolutely, he's up there. Um, you know, without a doubt. And I mean, he was a co-writer, wasn't he, on like the American Music Awards Song of the Year about a year or so ago. I can't remember what song that was, but um, yeah, yeah we we were actually very lucky on this show to give us ourselves a shameless plug. We got him, I think, just before he really hit the big time, and um, we dealt through his record label they were super pleasant and he was very very nice because I've, I've heard that um he doesn't he sort of he's moved on a lot from survivor and he's sort of because well, uh, one of our Oslets went to a concert of his and there was a meet and greet and she kind of said oh loved you on survivor you know so great and he was just kind of like uh-huh yep <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, yeah. I get super, that. super nice guy, but did not want to be remembered for his survivor. Experience. It's fascinating, kind of going into that. All I remembered was the fact, like, oh, cool, he was like he worked with NASCAR, wicked, um, and now here he is, like taking the world by storm. So, uh, hello, Chase, if you're yeah. listening, um, dude's living an interesting life. At least is. I'm looking forward to Spencer your country album coming out soon, no doubt. Oh, just wait. <laughs> It, that that will be singing. That will be a sticky situation. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Zachary Chong, uh, for both of you, was there a favourite tribal council moment from your respective seasons that um, was never aired that you can remember? Did either of you kind of have a moment in any tribal council that never made it? Let's start with you, Spencer. Can you remember anything? Yeah, I've got one. Um, I would say there was a, there it was a little moment, but it was. Uh, Jeff, uh, I feel bad. I'm, I'm like trashing Wu or something in this interview. But there was a moment where where Jeff um, asked Wu. Uh, he just I can't remember what the question was, but he asked him like uh, something related to the vote. It was it was like what what do you look for and who you're voting out? And Wu just gave this answer that was like, Yeah, Jeff. Uh, you know, today was a it was a tough storm and it was it was a tough day. You know, we don't have that much food. <laughs> Um, so I think, you know, tensions are high right now and, um, you know, this is, this is a stressful moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's just crazy. It's, it's, it's surreal that we're about to, you know, vote. And Jeff was like, woo, on a scale of one to 10 with one being, with one being, you, you just talked about something entirely unrelated to the question and 10 being, you nailed it. You're about a zero. <laughs> <laughs> and that was funny. <laughs> wow. Wow. We need to see that. That's like a Kim Johnson style answer from the Africa Final Tribal Council. Like, yeah, yeah. no sense to what was just asked. Marty, do you have anything that you remember? Yeah, we had a few. I mean, we I don't know. Spencer kind of had that moment. But I remember, I think, you know, part of Nicaragua was, especially in the beginning, that a lot of people in our cast just didn't know how to just didn't know how to engage, didn't know how to answer questions. You know, this guy who grew up in from Kansas, you know, that's a really cool you know, honest and goodness, knowledge, personality. And we were in the middle of a tribal, and somebody gave sort of the same kind of answer that Spencer just said, and Probst stopped all the cameras, you know, off his stupid. Well, he was like, 
or you will fuck you and and it was like every other word was an f bomb and basically telling us you know we will stay here for 12 hours until you guys give me what i need and you guys <laughs> deliver and answer the questions and kill me and i remember my mouth being like oh my god Jeff Probst just wow he just like dropped eight f bombs in a row and it was shocking <laughs> it was Truly, truly shocking, but it really got people, you know, understanding what it is and that, you know, you're here to deliver and you got to tell a story and you got to participate and be present. So that was that was pretty interesting. And then I think, um, you know, when Jimmy T was pretty emotional and I think it was pretty good. They, they edited a lot of that out, but it was very, very emotional for him. And he got very, very emotional as he saw where this was all going in the middle of tribal. And he was fighting for his life to, to stay in the game. Um, and they didn't show that. And then there's a controversy in my season between allegations that were made at a tribal where again, they had to stop the cameras and everything else because it was, it was purely hearsay, but it was, you know, allegations that were clearly outside of mortgage gate. Legality of the game and what are, yeah what was being asked so that was pretty interesting too and I think it, in part for me it kind of ruined uh, my season because it introduced stuff that pretty hearsay and and tainted the game because you didn't know whether did what these people were saying was it true was never captured on camera and it was pretty material like if if what they were saying actually and it could really influence, you know, what you thought of one person or the other. So that was kind of a bummer too. Be, so that's probably more than you wanted to hear. But this yeah. might be the very first time I've oh, that's... ever had someone from Nicaragua on the show, and nobody's asked me a question about Mortgage Gate. I swear it's just it's like you have people from certain seasons where you get a generic question about something at some point, and generally, oh, someone from Nicaragua is on the show. Oh, what happened with Mortgage Gate? Like it's always there, and it's yeah. <laughs> I didn't get one this time. It's always it's always there for me too in evaluating the season, and it's one of the things that makes me really it, it makes it hard for me to look back and and say, okay, you know, did this person play a good game? What was what all went into this that I didn't see? Um, especially regarding you know final outcome. So mm. it's I think it's it's a it's a scummy thing for everyone involved. I, I love hearing um, yeah. all these stories about Jeff Probst and his anger issues and all this sort of stuff because um, you know I, I've heard a lot. Of them but um <laughs> one of my two interactions with the man um he answered one of my he answered my question on the ama he did on reddit and i pointed out i'm like oh a lot of the survivors on my show say you swear a lot and he's like oh they say i swear a lot do i well they can go get fucking fucked or something like that like he, re- he replied <laughs> man, it might not have been to those exact words but it was something very similar um but yeah and he was on a he was on an australian talk show a couple of years ago where it was on um cable tv so you can swear and then jeff probes realizes halfway through the interview I can swear. Well, fucking hell, you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> and he just starts letting rip. But um, yeah, there you go. Um, now, a couple more here because I want to get to these final five rankings. Um, Ori Kohav uh, says, for you, Spencer, you've got to rank the following from bottom to top in big mouth level. Um, so you've got Cass, Garrett, Keith, and Drew. So, who is the least big mouth oh right through to the biggest big mouth? <laughs> big mouth? Just, like, talking a lot? or I am going to say yes. They've just simply said big mouth level. Okay. So, Cass, Garrett, Drew, and who? Uh, Keith. Keith. Okay. Biggest big mouth would certainly be Garrett. <laughs> um, Garrett, uh, during his exit interview with, with Rob Sesternino... I believe talked for about ten minutes straight without Rob getting a word in, which was pretty funny. Um, and he, you know, you saw it. He tried to basically um, filibuster our vote on the on that tribal council where he went home. He tried to just stop everyone else from communicating. Mm-hmm. Um, so he would be number one. Um, I don't really think of Cass as a big mouth at all. Um, you know, she's pretty quiet and introverted actually um so i i guess i would put her at the at the bottom um and uh between drew and keith i guess drew has to be the bigger big mouth so it would be um garrett drew keith Cass. there you go it's funny you mentioned about garrett and his exit interview um when i interviewed him i think our interview with him went longer than he had screen time on your season so uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
it, it, it kind of like he does like to talk a lot. But in all, in all fairness to Garrett, it was actually a yeah. very entertaining interview. So, oh yeah, no, he's great to talk game. I I think Garrett's awesome. And we after I finished the game, we talked about Survivor for literally about fifteen hours. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> We talked through the game. He, if you get him going on on the game and on scenarios, he will not stop. You will be the one to stop it. So he he can go forever, which is you know a, a good quality often and fun, but didn't work out great for him in the actual game for it for himself. Hello to Garrett, should he be listening. Thanks to everybody who sent in their listener questions. We've got some very good ones there, and uh, we always appreciate uh, the feedback. Now, we wrap up every single exit interview. Oh, exit interview. I've I'm, I'm, I'm got that on the mind now here, Spencer. Oh, yes, how did you both go on San Juan del Sur? Uh, we wrap up every re- <laughs> recap interview. Hopefully early. Yes, uh, with a set of five. Now, Marty, you, of course, did a recap with me last season during Spencer's season, uh, and I'm just looking here at your answers. You came on on episode eight, so you're at the halfway point, basically. Basically, you tipped Spencer to win, um, so yeah, kind of close. Uh, you said Wu was the dark horse, so yeah, you probably get a point for that because he got second. Um, Cass, you said would be next to go. Um, that didn't quite work out. You said you'd be on the Brains Tribe if you were to be on Brains Brawn or Beauty, and the player you said you were most similar to was Spencer. So, oh really? Yeah. <laughs> nice. All right. We're symbiotic now. You're going back to listen to this episode, Spencer. You're like, oh, I need to listen to this. Uh, <laughs> That's what I'm going to do right after this. Now, uh, here we go. The easiest one of this question in the entire season. I'll start with you, Marty. Who is your tip to win Survivor San Juan del Sur? Um, I'm, I'm going to go with Natalie again. I, you know, both just because I viscerally want her to win. I think, you know, no different than Fabio, for example, is, and we all know this, right? There's going to be a lot that goes into the last challenges here, and, you know, it's up for grabs, and whatever happens there can really dictate. And if Fabio hadn't won, you know, the last three challenges in a row, he never would have had a shot. So I'm going to put my bet on Natalie, and I'm going to hope that she, you know, makes it all the way to the end because I, yeah, we've talked about it at no end here. So that's that's where that's where my bet's going. Spencer? Yeah, I want the same. And I think that Natalie's odds of winning, unfortunately, are going to equal her odds of getting to the end. Um, which, if the other players get their heads on straight, which is a big if, um, sh- you know, they should want to stop her from doing that. So I'm going to go as my winner pick actually with Jacqueline. Ah, interesting. I am a big Jacqueline fan, and not just for the reasons <laughs> you think. Um, uh, I was going to say. Uh, that's not part <laughs> of it. But uh, um, I like if I had to personally choose who I want to win, I would say Jacqueline. I think Keith or Natalie's going to win. But um, that's just me. Anyway, we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk to you guys. Uh, the Dark Horse, who will sneak through and potentially take a sneaky win. This is kind of hard to answer with only five, really, because we've sort of covered a lot of this throughout. You said year three there, Spencer, so... Sure. Um, I mean... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would go with Keith. I think that he he could pull off, you know, the win that, as Marty astutely pointed out, would put him as probably the worst winner ever. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think Keith has a shot. I do. Marty, Dark Horse. Yeah, I would I would agree. I mean, and look, he's done really well in the challenges. So, and we know how important that is going into this last uh, last few days. So, I would I would have to put my bet on him as well. Now, generally, our next question is who do you think is going to be the next to go? I'm going to make it slightly different, given that we're in the finale. Uh, rank how you think it will finish. So, fifth through to first. So, we've, I've got you both got your first. So, you don't need to give me your winner. So, Marty, I'll start with you. Who do you think will be first to go at fifth? Who will be fourth? And then who will make up the final tribal council? Oh, so next to go. So yeah, who will be the first technically voted out in the first tribal council? <laughs> um, God, I'm looking at this right now and thinking. Uh, I don't know. This is just really just picking names, really. But I think that. Uh, Baylor. Baylor. So Baylor goes. Mm-hmm. Then who goes? Who 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 gets the Spencer Bledsoe fourth place? <laughs> um, 
after Baylor, uh, I think Missy. Missy. So then Natalie wins. So who's runner-up and who's third? Or do we maybe have a unanimous vote? I mean, how does it play out between uh, Jacqueline and Keith at the final tribal? Um, I would put Natalie, Jacqueline, and Keith. Done. All righty. Spencer. I will go, just to completely contradict myself, I will go with Keith as being fifth place. Um, I do think he has a shot to sneak in and win, but I think that's in the scenario where um, where something a little different happens, where what I think is, what I expect to happen is that um, Keith will be seen as the biggest threat next to Natalie at Final Five and will go home. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to unfortunately predict Natalie's departure at cool. fourth place. Okay. And I'm going to say that first place Jacqueline, second place Missy, third place Baylor. There we go. Done. Um, now, the next question is pretty much redundant because we've only got one couple left in the game. So this really borders down to a yes or no question. Usually the question I ask here, will any couple in this season um, turn against each other? And if so, who? So really it borders down to will Baylor and Missy turn on each other next week? Spencer. <laughs> Uh, no, they won't. I mean, they, they're on the same page. They, it, it, there is a possibility that they might mutually agree, okay, it's better for our odds if, if, if Baylor, you go on the jury right now and, and just let me try and win, uh, or vice versa. Um, but I don't think they're going to turn on each other in the sense of, of you know, Sierra Mor- or Laura Morad or anything like that. Okay. Marty, would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. Okay, done. I, I don't see that happening. There we go. Uh, now, the final question. Now, this can be answered on any contestant that has played this season. doesn't have to be from the final five. Out of all the players in this season, who played most similarly to how you played in your season? Marty, I'm going to start with you. With you who? Marty, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, so I would have to say most similar to me, I would probably go with Josh. Josh? I mean, uh, yeah. Okay. Spencer? We're, li- we're agreeing too much on this podcast where it's <laughs> <laughs> stealing all my answers. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, Drew Christie, but if, <laughs> if I can't pick him, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm b- basically I'm a badass. Yes. So I would have yes. to, you know, he would be my first choice. But yeah, I mean, I, I think I think Josh, um, Josh approached the game with a strategic mind and tried everything he could. And uh, unfortunately, just things didn't go his way, but I think he's a pretty savvy guy. Look at that. We started off... Not that I think I'm a savvy guy, but I try to be. Oh, well, I'm sure your girlfriend does, Spencer, and that's all that matters. Uh, we, we started off so nice, and we ended that way. How perfect. It's come full circle. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. I'm glad we could get this done. Uh, for the... Go, Spencer. For the self-proclaimed old, old asshole... <laughs> Um, and the self-proclaimed arrogant jerk, this has been a very surprisingly pleasant podcast. It's, <laughs> <laughs> there's been a lot of flattery for two guys who, who say they're, uh, <laughs> they're um, abrasive. Well, again, if anybody knows anything about Survivor Oz, I often get accused of this show being a massive suck fest. Um, you know, we, we, we even had a casting guy on Rob has a podcast all of two weeks ago saying that's all we do. So, yeah. hey, it's, it's turning full circle. That was my... <laughs> Sorry to sorry to interject, but that was I think uh, Marty and mine um, are our casting guy. There you go. See, can't scoff. <laughs> yeah, no, I have pl- plenty of good things to say about each other, but we've we've had no uh, no shortage of mean and bad things to say about people as well. So it's not an entire. Well, well let, let's <laughs> let's try something here before I let you both go. Say one negative thing about each other's game on Survivor. Go on, Marty. Ah, what was bad yeah. about Spencer's game on uh, Kagayan? I, I I almost I can't bring myself to do it. You're terrible. Ben. <laughs> Give it to I can't, me. I can't, Come on, Marty. It. Rip into Spencer. Come on. It's like Keith and, and Probst at the last tribal council. Give it to Give me. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you give it to me. I, uh, I I I can't do it. I'd have to go, I'd have to go back and watch some more to really find you know a a delicate uh, source of uh, constructive criticism. But uh, a politician. But <laughs> we we talked about we talked about my immaturity and in, in not having that Fabio skill set. There's that. <laughs> 
You know, it, we're we're so similar, Ben. It's almost like you're asking me to punch myself in the face. <laughs> well, that was my next question, but uh... <laughs> Spencer, come on, say something bad about Marty. Go on. It's yeah, easy. I'll Spence. hit him hard. You you really just uh, did not engender enough trust and love with Jane. <laughs> you uh, you you really uh, it was it was a shame to watch just America's sweetheart be be trounced and insulted by this. This pig, this she called you bully. farty by far. Um, so I was a bully. Was, that was you were a bully. It was inexcusable. God, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good enough. All right, it's just not good enough, guys. Seriously, thank you. It's been a lot of fun, um, Spencer. To you, uh, it's you know we're taking thirteen episodes to get you here, but you're here. We love it, and um, we love having you on the show, mate. Best of luck. Congratulations on graduating tomorrow. Literally at the time of recording this, great job. And um, look, this isn't the last time we'll get you on the show. We're having a Christmas episode in a uh, week. Come and share some eggnog with us in a week's time. Not- <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It's it's always fun to be on Survivor Oz. I really enjoy it, and I swear one day we're grabbing a beer, Marty. If if not soon, eventually, we will. And I want to make sure we all uh, understand what Spencer is going to be doing after he graduates, too. Do we get a little sneak peek at that, Spencer? What's what's <laughs> in store for Spencer? Sure. I mean, I the the machinations at Yahoo were tempting, but I decided <laughs> to go into the world of um, proprietary trading. Um, so I will be working at a prop shop in Chicago. Um, proprietary trading for all of those of you who don't, who aren't familiar with the very silly and and uh, ridiculous world of finance. Proprietary trading is just means the firm trades its own money. Um, so if you if you know anything about it, it the place I'm going to work for is a uh, options market maker. Um, basically, I'm just going to be doing uh, mental math and uh, and calculations and uh, having an excuse not to have any dress code at work and not really get a real job. So uh, it should be fun. Sounds like podcasting. That's awesome, man! Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. And Marty, always a pleasure with you, mate. Thank you so much. Particularly, um, you know, given the fact that you're over there in the UK, these transcontinental podcasts are first for us here in Survivor Odds. But uh, always a pleasure having you here, mate, too. And also, you, of course, welcome to our Christmas episode in a week, too, to join in with a glass of eggnog, if you so do wish. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me on. This is a great format to get some time to uh, spend with uh, Spencer. So I appreciate it for that as well. And there you have it, Marty and Spencer. For the very first time on an episode together, very, very, very entertaining, and uh, we obviously very much appreciate their time and going over this episode, the season, and looking ahead towards the finale. And of course, you can download each of their respective uh, individual interviews via SurvivorOz.com, and of course, uh, as you heard us discuss with uh, Marty there, his episode recap of Kagayan. Episode 8 recap he did with us last year. Now, looking ahead, speaking of the finale, we're going to look ahead to next week. Can you believe this season is about to come to an end? This time in one week, we will know who the winner is of Survivor Salman Del Sur, the 28th winner of Survivor. We are only moments away from knowing that, and we have got a big week planned in terms of coverage. And, of course, I'm going to let you know who is joining us for our finale recap in just a few moments. Our Oz Topsy from last night is available online right now to download, or you can watch it um, via Spreecast. Of course, also our exit interview with John will happen next week. Wednesday Australian time, uh, we put that up during the day. Now, our read uh, exit interview, which was, of course, a couple of days delayed after the rescheduling issue, that is available now. That was put up today, same time as this one, so you can hear that there. And uh, our final power rankings with myself, Noah, and Troy Zan will be up early next week as well. Our uh, finale, Oz Topsy, will be at 10.30 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Now, we will be doing that at the same time that the reunion is on in Australia, so therefore or um, feel free to join us at 11.30 if you want to watch the reunion. We'll still, be do- no doubt, be on air, but um, we'll, of course, go over the finale of the season and look ahead to Season 30 and also probably announce a few things that we have got planned very shortly. And, of course, as you saw, no doubt, on our social media and uh, heard me chat about in the episode just there with Spencer and Marty, our Christmas episode, our third annual Christmas episode is happening on uh, Monday the 22nd Australian time and uh, that is Sunday the 21st in the evening for our American and uh, Canadian and North American listeners. If you're in another part of the world, um, check your local time zones and work out where that will be for you. Now, I've teased you enough. The finale recap, it is, uh, as of right now, 
I just want to point out, not 100% confirmed. We're on about an 80 to 85% lock right now of who this is going to be. First of all, I will say that joining us for the finale recap, just like he did for the Caramoan recap three seasons ago, Mr. Brian Heideck, the greatest player in the history of Survivor, at least in my eyes, uh, winner of Thailand, a man who uh, is God amongst men, let's be honest. Uh, he is set to join us for the finale. But added to Brian Heideck, now this is all kind of just hinging on a few things, but we're thinking it's going to happen. Tanya Vance will be joining us, no matter what will happen. A fellow Thailand uh, player, of course, uh, Brian voted her out, but um, there were circumstances to that. Brian and Tanya were on an episode earlier this year together with our Oscars, but uh, we are very much hoping that not only will Tanya join us, but also the runner-up of Survivor Thailand, Clay Jordan. And if this happens, I believe this will be the first time in a very long time that both Brian and Clay have even spoken with each other. So uh, we saw a whole lot of that played out, and um, uh, two men who haven't had a whole lot to say to each other, I feel, over the years. And uh, it'll be very interesting to not only wrap up this season, but uh, make it a mini Thailand reunion, so to speak, to uh, get some thoughts from those guys. So get thinking of some questions. Uh, we're going to put it out a little bit earlier. Maybe Monday, Tuesday to get your finale questions in Just because we are expecting a few Every time we get Brian on, we often get a lot of questions So uh, feel free to start sending them in SurvivorOz at Hotmail.com.au Same with your John Mish exit interview questions And uh, of course we will start uh, putting them aside And getting them ready for the finale next week But we are very, very excited to be able to bring that to you And we're just fingers crossed that it all gets together the way we're planning and we have all three of them on the line with us no matter what. We always appreciate your support of our show Survivor Oz. Thank you so much for everybody, no matter where you listen to us, if you uh, listen to us on your phone, on the way to work um, you know, while you're gardening, you're laying in bed, uh, if you're being tortured in Guantanamo Bay and they're putting my voice out there, uh, we appreciate you listening all the same and um, without you guys we wouldn't be here doing what we do, so thank you very much for all of that. You can support the podcast of course by donating money if you wish to it is christmas time um so you know if you've got a bit of extra cash um you know, thinking of a good cause to give it to, uh, why not give it to us um, ahead of some other charities out there? And uh, also, of course, remember to uh, leave us some feedback via iTunes, Stitcher. We're now on TuneIn Radio, by the way, guys. Uh, that's another service you can listen to us. And, of course, you can listen to now all our episodes, um, all our recent ones on YouTube. We'll be backtracking and going over some of the older episodes over time, and um, you can listen to some of those on YouTube as well. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. All the jazz you know about is how you do it. And that way you can stay up to date with everything to do with Survivor Oz. Until next week, though, for the penultimate time on a Survivor San Juan del Sur episode recap, my name is Ben. The tribe has spoken, and we will speak to you next time on The Trains.